I have to say that this country is a dizzy, dizzying and remarkable place with someone of your history, someone of your deep decency and humanity and optimism, that you could share the same sobriquet, the same moniker, American, with the current commander in chief, with his dark and pessimistic vision of the nation, his belief that many of us in the room are part of the swamp he's purporting to drain. I was reminded, uh, or, or this was brought to my attention by Dennis Hayes last week, that our own Bill Ruckelshaus was on the radio interviewed last week, and when he was asked, um, on your second tour of the EPA under Reagan, were you sent back there to drain the swamp of the Gorsuch fiasco? To which he replied in his wonderful Midwestern deadpan, something to the effect of, no, we called them wetlands, and we're in the business of protecting them. <laughs> so can we give it up for Bill Ruckelshaus? And at least this darkness allows us to have this group hug tonight, which is pretty amazing. Uh, allows us to come together in a way that we're all, I think, clamoring for. And for those leaders like you, Vien, and Bob, and WEC to forcefully reject the, the craziness of the carnage and the disaster everything and the xenophobia, and to lead with a communal progressive vision based on the public interest, on science, on love, and let's just say it, on hope. I haven't given up on hope. Václav Havel asserted some years ago that hope isn't prognostication, it's an orientation, and that's your orientation, Vienna, and it needs to be ours, so thank you so much. Let's hear it again for her. And I am procrastinating because I have gone after Van Jones two times in this town, and now I have to go over after you, and you know, there's this ask thing that we have to do. It's, it's a fiction, and there you go. And I have the envelope to see who the asker is, and it says, Peter Goldman. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh my God, it's Martha Kongsgaard. Okay, that's who I am, in case you don't know who I am. But it's, all about the segue and these things, and it's super awkward. So I'm gonna do now for something completely different, and at this point, probably frighteningly predictable for those of you who know me, and I did have laryngitis last week, but when the booze in your eyes makes you bid on men's ties, it's an auction. <laughs> When the cause it is just made that vase seem a must that you just won. When it's Joan and her crew and they're counting on you at the auction. Take a big swig of wine, put your bid on the line, multiply by eight or nine at the auction. <laughs> So, thank you. So, come on, I thought I'd moved on from being the asker. I, I've been a keynote for like 10 years, and now that I've stepped down from the partnership, I am back on second bill, which I <laughs> guess is understandable, and I'm just gonna have to get used to it. But I have been asked many, many times, and I've had the good fortune of being the asker, which makes you be the decider. And I've done this long enough to, um, to, uh, Go, it goes far back enough so that you all should understand that um, that was a Bush 43 um, uh, note. And I'm, I'm losing my mind, my mind here. Here we are. Um, but I have to say that this is the preferable setting to breakfast. And I've done this after Van Jones at breakfast for Climate Solutions 10 years ago. This a ballroom after a long meal with a lot of wine, followed by dessert and a rowdy group spurred on by charismatic speakers as we've heard tonight. A feel-good video. These huge montages up here um, in a darkened and cavernous room whose occupants can be seen as the lights come up, dabbing their eyes as the lights come up and shaking their heads at both the horror of the issue being addressed 
in agreement with the righteousness of the mission of the group being feted. <laughs> this is all you, so you need to pay attention. <laughs> or sometimes, in an auction, raise the paddle situation like this evening, where even the most unengaged in the underlying charities event, you know who you are, Jay invited you, you invited Jay, now you have to come back for Jay's table. <laughs> what is this cause, anyway? Even they can get sucked up in the boozy, enthusiastic, late-night one-upmanship that goes on in this discreetly northwestern town. <laughs> and let me be clear, that's a good thing. You don't have to care. You just need to raise your paddle. <laughs> and in those settings like this evening, where the whole evening then is prologue to the ultimate ask and the writing of the generous checks, the crowd being as it is psychologically and biological clockwise, <laughs> at its prime. <laughs> at this point of the evening, there's a mixture that is planned for that's a potent blend of sleepiness, slightly raised blood alcohol level, and a ticking babysitter meter. <laughs> and the epilogue, then, is therefore the capturing of donors who otherwise, say at 7.30 in the morning, would be either unavailable, uninterested, or biologically unpersuadable without a Bloody Mary. That is not you. But, excuse me, what is this artifice, the ask, this kabuki theater, that hopefully has enough swelling music and uplifting storytelling that you understand that we are a narrative species and that in some ways our future depends on getting the story right tonight, right now? Is the paddle raise up to the task of financing the big, hairy issues that WEC is responsible for, that our lives substantially depend on? Do we just give a donation, have a bake sale, and pray? I hope not. Um, but you're a different kind of crowd. You are the choir, obviously, who came here for this big communal hug. Um, and you came here not unsuspectingly into this room, only for a party. But rather, you've come intentionally, singularly, prepared to write the biggest check you can, believing that the degradation of where and how people live the warming of the planet and the souring of the seas, the abrogation of treaty rights, the extirpation of keystone species, and pteropods alike is not inevitable, and that we have a choice and a responsibility and a say in the matter. And I could go on on how we structurally are part of this problem, but I've been told this is not a keynote, so I'm, get to the ask already. But sometimes institutions and their story can suffice as a proxy for an entire sector's history and progress. WEC, as you heard, was birthed in 1967 and grew during one of the most dynamic eras of American history and was the chief architect of the environmental history of Washington State. And so many of you in this room were participants there. From the first meeting, which was a float trip, with William O. Douglas down from Tianaway Dam to Rotary Park on the Yakima River, when a flotilla of rafters and inner tubers and canoes paddled toward the first of thousands of press conferences that they would go on to stage. WEC has singularly flexed and strengthened the 50 years of muscle necessary to get to the people's work. On December 19, 1969, WEC was incorporated with $2,671 in the bank. Imagine that, excuse me. Our goal for this evening is $350,000. Many times that original bank account, and even when the raise of the paddle happens, there'll be a $50,000 match, which is 20 times that number. Since then, WEC has morphed with the times and led on a wide swath of what I think we diminutively call environmental issues. How? We've done it by using the rule of law, the court of public opinion, raw electoral politics, the markets, the press, economics, tribal treaty rights, the public comment and press conferences, flotillas, and statistics, fundraising, shoe leather, social marketing, grassroots organizing, and education, moral suasion, imagination, regulation, incentives, guilts, inspiration, and perspiration, outright purchase and outright outrage, but not a little humor. And what have we done? Do the math. WEC has been the steward, the defender, and the advocate for over 10 million acres 
of state and private forest land and over two million acres of state-owned tidelands. And if we haven't given it up for Hillary, Franz, let's do it again. <laughs> My so-called lawyer husband gave me those statistics in case you were wondering where I got them. But that's over a quarter of the land mass of the state and of all the rivers and of all the water in the ground and above, the stormwater, the spring flows for fish and farmers from the Palouse out to Nia Bay. They've crafted protections on the urban landscape through the GMA, as we heard, building standards and the SMA, protecting vulnerable animals through the ESA. They have been on the front on issues ranging from farm worker health to herring abundance, Fred Fellerman. Coal fire power plants to vehicle miles traveled, from OA and climate policy to saving Puget Sound. And this year, God willing, with your help, we'll save this Puget Sound partnership from a near federal zeroing out. <laughs> this raised the paddle. Part of the program is the pure philanthropic act of the night. Sure, there's gonna be some wine, there'll be some whiskey and a match to spur you on, but this is the penultimate act of caritas, agape, sadaka. This is the potlatch, and it's what's gonna help save your bacon as well. It's the chance to publicly iterate your deeply held beliefs about the relationship with this one nature, people and nature on the same Mobius strip, about our role in safeguarding our home and its place to make manifest your understanding of the foundational work that WEC will need to be engaged in endlessly, creatively, optimistically, out several generations, and surely for another 50 years. WEC has always relentlessly pushed us, when necessary, to the edge of where we don't yet have the will or the imagination to go, where free enterprise and reluctant politicians refuse to tread. And they back it up with science and policy expertise bodies and voices with intellectual rigor and excellence and integrity. They are the gold standard. And yes, they are the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So are you bragging or complaining? I'd say that's a good thing. And today in March of 2017, after having navigated multiple cycles over the last 15 years of political chicanery and nobility, with the planet in our transitory care, and a mad hatter at the helm. That should be a source of great comfort and a safe and smart investment for all of us here tonight. So I'm gonna to close tonight, and I say that to give you hope that I'll stop talking, <laughs> but by um, invoking with very lovely, loving memory a great friend of the Washington Environmental Council who I served with on the board in the mid-90s. There are many people who we could call up in memory, Joan and Vim and on and on. But I'm talking about John Aram, who died in a fall in 2010 on Storm King in the North Cascades that he loved so well. He fought in the courts for the people and the things we love, and his death has, over these years, caused many of us to reflect on his life of purpose and, and how ours stacked up, not so much to his, but as to the moral challenges presented by this complex world we're all living in. And we've asked ourselves, what would we attempt? What would we safeguard and with what vigor? How would we live if we thought we couldn't fail, if we thought this would be our last year on this lovely green planet? Let's start to answer that question tonight, shall we? Right now, our citizenry requires us to make conscious decisions and investments in the big and the small that add up to a public iteration of our privately held beliefs. The sidelines are not for us, not now, not this evening. They never have been for the Washington Environmental Council. So let's make a decision tonight to invest in the big thing, the adult thing, the enduring thing, the thing that's in the public interest, the planet's interest, and I think our self-interest and theirs. Thank <laughs> you.